Good day. In my programme yesterday, I discussed how, based on reporting from the London Times, the Ukrainian military on the Donbass front line looks increasingly demoralised and debilitated, with even one of the soldiers admitting that Ukraine can't win the war without NATO help and that the uh, Ukrainian army seems to be trapped in trench warfare and isn't, doesn't look as if it's going anywhere. I also discussed how following comments from NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg, it was quite clear that in the event of a war between Ukraine and Russia, there would be no military intervention by NATO on Ukraine's side. It seemed quite clear to me that the only response would be further sanctions. And in effect, we subsequently had confirmation of this from um, the United States, from Secretary of State Antony Blinken, no less. He said the following, or is reported by NBC to have said the following, we've made it clear to the Kremlin that we will respond resolutely including with a high range of economic measures that we have refrained from pursuing in the past. Notice that he doesn't say what those measures are, and we'll come to that in a moment, but the fact that he's talking about economic measures in the event of a war between Russia and Ukraine again confirms that there is not going to be any military intervention by NATO in Ukraine in the event, in the event of a war there between Ukraine and Russia. And the, there were some questions about this, by the way, which were made to the um, NATO Secretary General, Jens Stoltenberg, at the last press conference following the end of the um, 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 NATO Foreign Minister's meeting, which Blinken attended. And Stoltenberg was asked directly, by Andrea Mitchell of NBC about what would um, NATO do in the event of a conflict between Ukraine and Russia. And in fact, this is Andrea Mitchell's question. I wanted to ask you about the serious consequences to Russia, given that Ukraine, if they are threatened with an invasion, is not obviously not a NATO member. So what more could NATO do? what would be the economic and political consequences? And um, Stoltenberg replied, um, uh, we have a wide range of options to make sure that Russia will be confronted with serious consequences if they once again use force against an independent sovereign nation, Ukraine. Everything from economic sanctions, financial sanctions, political restrictions. There's no word there of any form or uh, any form of military support. And quite clearly, that is not an agenda in the event of a war between Ukraine and Russia. A war which, let me reiterate again, can only happen if there is a Ukrainian attack on the Donbass. Um, in that event, Ukraine is on its own. We've had Ukrainian soldiers admitting to the London Times that without NATO support, Ukraine can't win. And so the conclusion must be that in the event of a war between Ukraine and Russia, Ukraine will lose. Now, these are the comments that we've now had from the Western powers. I will come back to them in a moment and I'll discuss what I think some of these sanctions might be. But we've also had some far more interesting comments from President Putin, no less, about the general situation in along Russia's western border. And Putin made these comments at a speech, a reception of uh, foreign ambassadors who were presenting to him their credentials. And it was a speech that he made in the Kremlin. And he made these comments over the course of that speech. The threat on our western border is really growing, and we have mentioned it many times. It is enough to see how close NATO military in infrastructure has moved to NATO Russia's border. This is more than serious for us.
In this situation, we are taking appropriate military technical measures. But we, I repeat, we are not threatening anyone, and it is at the very least irresponsible to accuse us of this, given the real state of affairs. That would mean laying the blame at the wrong door, as the Russian saying goes. In my speech at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, I already stressed that the priority facing Russian diplomacy at this juncture is to try to ensure that Russia is granted reliable and long-term security guarantees. While engaging in dialogue with the United States and its allies, we will insist on the elaboration of concrete agreements that would rule out any further eastward expansion of NATO and the deployment of weapon systems posing a threat to us in close proximity to Russia's territory. We suggest that substantive talks on this topic should be started. I would like to note in particular that we need precisely legal, juridical guarantees because our Western colleagues have failed to deliver on verbal commitments they made. Specifically, everyone is aware of the assurances they gave verbally that NATO would not expand to the East, but they did absolutely the opposite in reality. In fact, Russia's legitimate security concerns were ignored and they continue to be ignored in the same manner even now. We are not demanding spe any special terms for ourselves. We understand that any agreements must take into account the interests of both Russia and all other states in the Euro-Atlantic region. A calm and stable situation should be ensured for everyone and is needed by all without exception. Now, Stoltenberg, in response to that, acted in a way that I found borderline hysterical. When he was asked about what this meant, and I'm quoting now directly from um, um, the um, NATO website, when he was asked to comment on Putin's statement, he said the following, and he reduced it um, to essentially a question, by the way, about the about Ukraine. And he said that, he said the following, he said, the message is that it is only Ukraine and 30 NATO allies that decide when Ukraine is ready to join NATO. Russia has no veto. Russia has no say. And Russia has no right to establish a sphere of influence trying to control their neighbours. Now notice how Stoltenberg immediately treats this Russian re demand that NATO do what it promised, which is refrain from ex expanding eastward into a Russian policy of establishing a sphere of influence in NATO's absence. That's not what Putin said. It's Stoltenberg's interpretation. It shows the extent to which, in the neocon mindset, Everything is a zero-sum game. If we don't advance, the other side will advance in our place. If we don't move forward, and um, if we instead retreat, they will then move and take, uh, up, take over from us. Now, as I said, I repeat again, that's not what um, Stoltenberg said. So, sorry, that's not what Putin said, and it's a fundamental mistake and a misinterpretation of his words to talk in that way. But consider what else Stoltenberg had to say. He says that Russia has no veto and Russia has no say. Russia has no say, apparently, on issues which the Russians construe as having a direct impact upon their own security. That isn't just unbelievably arrogant, it is completely unrealistic. You cannot talk to a military superpower in that sort of way. You cannot imagine that you can simply d dictate decisions upon the Russians in that sort of manner. Now, 
If I return to Putin's statements, the Russians have never actually set out the position on eastward expansion in this way. They have never previously, at any point since the end of the Cold War, or even, by the way, during the Cold War, said that they now insist that there is to be, in effect, an international treaty which will limit the expansion of NATO eastward and which will reduce military forces, NATO military forces, in area close to Russia's borders. Um, the fact that Putin is talking in this way is a sign of growing Russian confidence. The Russians feel that events are moving increasingly in their favour and that before very long they will be able to, if you like, force or oblige the Western powers finally to take their security concerns into account. And the reason <clears throat> the Russians are feeling increasingly confident in that way is threefold. Firstly, their military power has massively increased since the 1990s. Russia today, um, unlike the situation in the 1990s, is military, militarily strong, whereas before it was militarily weak. We can see the extent of Russian military strength from NATO's effective acceptance that in the event of a Russia-Ukraine war, NATO will not intervene directly on Ukraine's side. In that kind of a conflict, NATO would risk defeat or it would risk nuclear war, and NATO is not prepared to take either risk. So the Russians increasingly feel that the military balance in Eastern Europe is tilting increasingly in their favour. They also sense that the general geopolitical, geostrategic balance is tilting in their favour also. They now have a firm ally in China. China obviously is a global superpower, comparable in some respects to the United States. That gives Russia enormous leverage over the West. It means that the Russians have no risk in a confrontation with the West, are becoming di diplomatically isolated, and they sense that that gives them leverage over the West of a sort and of a type that they never had before. And lastly, and this is where we come to the question of sanctions, the Russians are feeling increasingly confident in economic terms. And here one has to discuss again and briefly the nature of the sanctions that the United States and the Western powers are perhaps thinking about if there is a conflict in eastern Ukraine. And let's go back to those words of Blinken and of Stoltenberg. Now, Blinken said that there would be sanctions of a sort that uh, the Western powers have refrained from imposing before, and Stoltenberg talks about economic sanctions and financial sanctions. Now, if we're talking about economic sanctions, there are, I think, now definite limits to the nature of what those sanctions could be. Imposing sanctions on oil and gas exports from Russia or, or food exports from Russia would have catastrophic consequences for the world economy, including for the Western economies. I cannot imagine that even neocon uh, influenced governments would want to take such a step. I think it would be disastrous for them, and I don't think they would go that far. They would no doubt impose a swathe of restrictions on all sorts of other exports, and they would also no doubt try to limit Western investment in Russia. But again, I have to say that Westerners, to my mind, overestimate the effect of Western investment in Russia itself relative to Russia's overall economy and of the extent to which Russia now imports goods from the West. I think Westerners imagine that imposing that sort of economic blockade would cause the Russian economy to crater when the reality is that it would not. 
Russia's economy would quickly readjust. And of course, it now has a major trade partner in the form of China, which would probably uh, be happy to take up the slack. And then, of course, there is the other sanctions. And these are the sanctions which I think Blinken and the um, NATO powers probably still imagine is the, is the magic bullet. Firstly, sanctions on um, sovereign debt. Well, they've already been talked about. Blinken discussed them in the, in, the, in the spring and early summer. They were mooted at that time. The Russians shrugged their shoulders, as did financial markets, because the Russians, to the extent that their government borrows, no longer, it no longer borrows on international markets. It, it borrows on the far more advanced Russian financial markets, far more advanced than they were back in 2014. And the Russians can fill all their funding uh, needs from within the Russian financial market in a way that was not the case back in 2014. There would be a difficult period for Russia, a readjustment, but readjustment would indeed take place. The second sanctions, and I think this is the one which, as I said, they really do still think is the magic bullet, is disconnection from the SWIFT interbank messaging and payment mechanism. The problem with that is that the Russians have already game plan planned against it, and they also have their own alternatives to SWIFT set up and ready to move into operation. Certainly, the Russians would have, again, a probably difficult period of adjustment. But after perhaps a year, no doubt, I, no doubt everything would be back in Russia itself, essentially to normal. Russian banks would be able to send money to each other. They would continue to be able to send money to transfer money to countries like China, which, as I said, is now becoming an increasingly important trade partner. I can't really see that this is anywhere close to being the magic bullet that Westerners imagine that it is. Western, Western governments are known to be frustrated and bewildered that the sanctions which were imposed on Russia in 2014 failed to work in the way that Western governments imagined that they would. And I can't see why they think that these additional sanctions, these further sanctions, are going to make the kind of difference that they expect or believe. Anyway, the important thing to take away from all of this is that we are now moving into a different, entirely different diplomatic landscape. Up to now, when we're talking about Europe, it is the Russians who have been responding to Western moves. The West took the initiative to expand NATO e eastward. The Russians reacted. The NATO took uh, uh, the West, backed the forcible change of government in Ukraine. The, the Russians responded to that. There were the events in Crimea. There were the events in Donbass. There were all sorts of things of that kind. For the first time since the end of the Cold War, it is the Russians who are now making demands of the West. They are saying that they now want legal guarantees that NATO expansion eastward must stop. What they are saying is that they will not tolerate NATO expansion into places like Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova and the rest and that they insist that there must be a treaty agreed by the Western powers, that that will not happen. They also want some form of treaty which will restrict the deployment of Western uh, uh, military uh, systems close to Russia's borders. The Russians have never made this sort of demand before, but they are making it now, and that is something completely new. And as I said, it speaks of a major growth in Russian self-confidence, a belief that in military, geopolitical, diplomatic 
and economic terms, the balance of forces, the balance of power, what the Russians still sometimes refer to as the correlation of forces, is beginning to tilt increasingly in their favour. Now, to be very clear, I don't think anybody in Moscow thinks that this administration, the Biden-Harris administration, chaotic and confused as it is, is going to come round and is going to agree to this. And we've seen the reaction from Stoltenberg, the almost, as I said, hysterical reaction. Russia has no veto. Russia has no say. Russia is not entitled to create a sphere of influence. As I said, um, comments which are, to my mind, both utopian and arrogant, and if I have to say so, frankly, somewhat demented. But regardless of that, the Russians have said before that with respect to Ukraine, they're prepared to wait, and with respect to NATO, they are prepared to wait also. And Putin, in that speech which he made at the Russian Foreign Ministry, a speech which, to my mind, is going to become one of the most important speeches of the Cold War era. It's going to be gradually understood to have marked a fundamental break in Russian foreign policy. He said what Russian tactics henceforth are going to be. They're going to maintain a strategy of tension in Eastern Europe. They're going to move troops around. They're going to have situations like the one in Ukraine, where the Ukrainian military is pinned down. They're going to carry out exercises in the Black Sea, in the Baltic Sea. They're going to continue to build up their military forces. They're going to continue to carry out exercises. They're going to expand economic contacts with the Donbass republics. They're going to give citizenship to the bon Donbass republics. They're going to keep the European powers, NATO and the United States, continuously off balance until the point is finally reached when the NATO powers, the Western powers, finally accept that the Russians have fundamental security interests in Eastern Europe and negotiate in earnest to acknowledge those and to respect them. Time, from the Russian point of view, is on their side. And the fact that all that NATO can come up with in response to the deteriorating situation in Ukraine is more talk of sanctions, a sanctions weapon that has already been used and which has already failed to work, and which, if used further, was, is going to have a bigger impact, as it seems to me, on the West than it may on Russia itself. It shows why the Russians feel increasingly confident in this situation and sense that the balance is moving in their favour. We may be in for a very long wait. It may take five years. It may take ten years. It might take even longer than that. But in time, that negotiation that the Russians, that Putin is proposing, will take place and an agreement will be reached. Or, alternatively, there will be something far more dramatic, which, from a Western point of view, can only end in a debacle. We shall see how long it takes, what the Western powers do, whether they do perhaps go for broke and start a war, which they will lose and which will end in a debacle, or whether in time they will grit their teeth and they will negotiate with the Russians in earnest as the Russians insist and as the Russians increasingly feel that they are in a position to insist and impose. What I would say is this. In a live stream that I did um, yesterday on Locals, a, a viewer, a commentator, um, a person who asked me a question on the live stream made what I think is an extremely um, insightful point. He said that what at the moment is simply a Russian demand, a demand that NATO eastward expansion stop, that there be a treaty, 
and that Western forces be pulled back from Russia's borders, will one day, if it is not satisfied, become a Russian ultimatum. In other words, a Russian threat that unless that happens, Russia will take action to enforce its view, or rather to impose its solution um, in Eastern Europe. I don't think we are close to that point yet. But if Western powers don't, at some point, agree to negotiate, then that Russian ultimatum may indeed come. And at that point, it will be shown that all these brave words from people like Stoltenberg are indeed every bit as hollow as they truly are. Well, thank you for joining me today for this program. I look forward to you joining me again soon in future programs on this channel. Um, I um, um, And also, um, please remember to join us on our main channel, The Duran, where I do programs with my colleague and friend, Alex Christoforou. Please also uh, remember to join us on Locals, where we have a thriving channel at the moment, uh, a thriving platform, a thriving community at the moment, which is publishing an increasing amount of exclusive content, where both Alex and I publish our own exclusive content, including con con content that now covers increasingly the political struggles in the United States, which are, of course, so compellingly interesting, and other hot topics, which, shall we say, are difficult to discuss elsewhere. And you can also um, um, listen to my live streams. They're now regularly coming out every Wednesday. Um, and, of course, we're also on other platforms, BitChute, Library, Odyssey, SuperU, and, of course, Rumble, which is now um, um, connected to uh, locals. The two companies have combined. And, of course, you can support us by supporting us via Patreon and Subscribestar and by going to our shop and buying the things that you will find there, our amazing products there, our magic mugs, our hats, our hoodies, our sweatshirts, our t-shirts, and all the rest. And thank you again for joining me today. Please remember to press the like button if you like this video, and please also remember to check your subscription to this channel. Thank you again for joining me. More from me soon, and have a wonderful day until we speak again.